All right. Welcome back, all you beautiful bulletproof handymen and women. We got Rick Sutton in the room. Uh, Rick has been kind enough to come back into this room like four times while I try to figure out the software because it would not let me record. And before we get started, I want to give everybody a big apology. I had three webinars scheduled this weekend. I did two of them yesterday, and today I was on a move out. It took me too long, and I got home too late to do the webinar, so I apologize to the nine of you who showed up for that, and I wasn't there. I'm always preaching that we need to follow through on things, and I did not today. So you have my sincere apology. I will be scheduling one for next week, and if y'all are watching this, I'll email you the link for the webinar next week. But I do sincerely apologize. I was just too late to be able to make it. So we got Rick in here. Rick, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Awesome. I can hear you great, too. Can you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, yep. First off, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it and I appreciate all you're doing for us. So uh, huge, uh, huge thank you to you to start with. So I'm uh, I've been a licensed builder uh, here in uh, southeast Michigan for about 30 years, mostly doing residential remodeling, kitchens, baths and basements and just kind of got tired of that. It's just a tough time to be a general contractor right now, I think. So I want to get into handyman stuff, which is what I started with about 35 years ago. And sometimes wonder why I got out of it, but uh, yeah. it's okay. It's all good. I mean, I learned a ton and I provided a good service. So that was good. It's just a not good. I don't think it's a good business model anymore. I think it's pretty hard. Yeah. It's not a good business. What? Sorry. You cut out there a second. Uh, I don't think it's a great business model anymore. As, as yeah. well as it was many years ago. I mean, subs are so buried. Um, I've never seen the price be so high and the service be so low. Homeowners are home all the time. You know, by the time you do two, three, four, six hundred hours on a big project to try to bid that and make money on it at a price people will pay is just really, really challenging these days. Do you have any idea why? Do you think it's just the economy and inflation and everything? Or is it that there aren't because I'm focusing on what you were saying about the subs, which I agree with. It's just starting to get to the point where literally nobody wants to work. The people that do want to work want way too much money, which is fine if they're delivering the quality that comes with that. But they don't want to deliver the quality either. Is that like the biggest hassle for you or is it more of the homeowners just not being able to afford it in the first place. I think it's a combination of a few things. I mean, back in the day, you know, you'd pay $80 to get a journeyman or a master plumber or electrician. Nowadays, you're paying 140 for two, you know, 20 some year olds. One is not even a journeyman. The other one's a helper. And sometimes I feel like I know more than they do, but I got to use them, right? Because it's a permit job. Yeah. So that just drives the cost up. And when I put all my you know, if you know your numbers, the amount of overhead you have, like you've shown in your numbers, just gets to be so amount. So what's, you know, 1.5 on $280 an hour for two young men, it's just hard to sell that, right? I mean, it just yeah. gets to be, and, you know, cabinets used to be $300 a box. Now they're seven or $800 and post COVID, most of it's junk, even if you spend that much for it. I mean, we could almost yeah. send every box back. How yeah. do you put 1.5 on that? You know, it's just hard, hard to do that. And then add the fact that clients are home a lot now, right? They're working from home, they're homeschooling. All the time, yeah. So you Which is to... horrible trying to do any big job around yes. the house with the people there in the house. Yes. And I've got great clients and they're like family to me. And that's good and bad because sometimes you find yourself not being a good businessman because you're kind of treating them like family and that can be awkward at times, but um, I've gotten through it all. It's just the subs are hard. The homeowners watch a lot of HGTV, you know, and they think, you know, their kitchen can happen for 20 grand mm -hmm. and they can't buy cabinets for $20,000, yeah. right? So you put all that together with the fact that the subs are just so buried. I used to be able, you know, 10 years ago, I could take a three months job and schedule it within two or three days of completion. Now I don't even tempt it. I just say, look, we'll get done when we get done because there's just so yeah. many things that come up that we can't control. Well, then where's the next job after that, right? I mean, you're either behind and then you're playing catch up all year or you got this downtime. And when you've got big jobs that have 12 to 20 week lead times, you just can't call up somebody and say, hey, I'm, I can start your job early because you're just not prepared for it. Yeah. So it's just getting impossible. I think it's just getting really hard. Now, maybe if you work for the super elite or whatever, but what what I found is 
how I've been doing it, you know, when all of a sudden done and make $30 an hour or something, you know, I mean, just not a worth for all that aggravation. It's just not enough money. And I'll go back and say, well, if I wanted to make 60, how would I have to change the job? Well, now the $20,000 labor only hallway bath needs to be 30, 32 grand. No one's going to pay for it because by the time they buy selections, it's 40,000 bucks. Most people yeah. don't want to spend that kind of money. No, exactly. And you were mentioning the HGTV thing. I don't know. I don't really have time to watch very much of that, but I do enjoy that kind of stuff if I do have a little bit of downtime. And one of the funny things I notice is when I'm watching, I can see issues arising that, you know, most people can't. But if you're in the industry, you can watch it and you can go, ah, oh, that's going to be a problem. And then all of a sudden cut to the next scene and that problem disappeared and they never had to it. Like you'll see the floor sink down. And you'll go, oh, God, that's going to be an issue. And then all of a sudden, the floor's not sinking down anymore. And nobody had any content on it on the show. And you know they're 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 making content is what they're doing. They're not really yeah. teaching. It's not an educational show. It's entertainment. I, and I the like homeowners this. watch that, and they think that their job should go as smoothly as the jobs on there. They always pick one thing, you know, like, oh, it turns out this is a load-bearing wall, so we're going to have to take an extra six grand out of the budget you know, to put a big header up there or something, but they don't show you the other 10 things that also went wrong that they had to fix. Yep. And, you know, I, I get some good design ideas from the HG TV shows. I mean, I think they have that right, but the cost of materials and the scheduling, the time of completion is just so far wrong. And when people see that, they just think, like I said, they think their kitchen is going to be four weeks and 20 grand. And it's like, well, your cabinets are going to be 20 and we won't even get drywall up in four weeks because, you know, we've got all this stuff to do. We got to wait for trades people. And even the city inspections now, you know, they, they've farmed out a lot of their stuff to third parties. And yeah. some cities say like, well, we do electrical inspections on Monday and Wednesday. Well, what happens if you miss Wednesdays? You can't do anything till you wait till it comes around again yeah. to the following Monday again. And it's, you know, you have a bad handyman day, you're going to lose some money. But if you have one of these bad jobs, you, it can take your business out from right underneath yeah, you. It can just mean, take you down and you just got to go get a job now. And, and I mean, I'm a, I'm an ex engineer. I worked for IBM and general electric for a bit. So I just tried to bring that professionalism into the trades. And I found out if you just did that and you're in the top 95% as it is, right? Yeah, because you exactly. just don't see it. And what I found is everybody's completing to be cheaper Nobody's competing to be the best. So I just said, I'm going to compete to be the best because I don't have a lot of competition. And I and I did well at it. It's just, it's gotten a lot harder in the last five years. Yeah. And you know, something else you mentioned was, uh, unless you're working for the elites. And I think that's one of the bigger problems on YouTube right now is there's not just YouTube, it's everywhere, but there's this idea that I can get rich being a handyman by working for the elites. Like I'm just going to work for rich people and they're going to pay me $500 to come troubleshoot and swap out a, a, or just to reset a GFCI outlet. And I think that becomes a problem because then everybody thinks the focus is just simply finding the right type of customer. They think the focus is just like saying no to the wrong customers, saying yes to the right customers. And then like you were saying, you know, demand your value without really like spending a lot of time figuring out what the value is. Like what I do with my property managers, I literally figured out what value it is they're looking for. Not everybody's, you know, it's like you can have it, uh, what is they, they say you can have it good, fast or cheap. You know, right. you got to pick two. Yep. I looked at my property managers and figured out what it is that they value, what I can give them that they really, really want. And then what I can tone down a little bit that they're not as concerned about. But I don't think there's enough focus on that uh, for the new guys coming into the industry, I don't think there's enough people out there telling them like, hey, first and foremost, you have to behave like a business. You have to be a professional. You have to be articulate when you talk to them on the phone. You have to be dressed decently. It doesn't have to be a work uniform, but you need to be clean and decently groomed when you show up to their house. You have to show up on time, not drunk, not high, you know, just all the basics. But like you were saying from the industries you came from, if you just carry that professionalism in to the handyman trade, you're just instantly in the top 10%. You're yeah. already top 10% on day one, even if you don't know much about the work, because you know as well as I do, none of this is hard. 
None of it. I have no doubt. I don't know how to frame a house. Absolutely do not know how I would be lost if I needed to do it. But I have no doubt I could just learn how to do it. There's steps involved to all of these things. And the people that get into these industries that are experts at it today, they're not 160 IQ and they didn't go to Harvard. They're, they're just hardworking, grown men who paid attention, learned, watched, asked questions, figured out how to get the job done, and then started working on getting better and better. Yeah. So what are your plans then? So I, um, I initially was going to work for homeowners because I just thought, well, that's kind of like what I've got this huge Rolodex of people already for. And I would just up my prices to, you know, I thought I'd start at 75 bucks an hour, which was almost twice what I was making. So I'm thinking like, well, heck, this is going to be great. And then I looked into that and it's like, okay, I need SEO. I need a website, you know, my business name that says, you know, Sutton Construction Inc., well, you know, that's not really going to be for handyman service. So now I need a second EIN number. And I just started going, oh, my gosh, this is going to be a big, big deal. And then all of a sudden I listened to one of your podcasts and it just got me thinking. And I listened to about 20 more of them. And I just said, this is just a lot better of a model because it removes a bunch of things. And this catchphrase that, oh, property managers won't pay anything they want it done cheaply is just not true because there's homeowners that fall into that bracket just the same, or you'll get homeowners yeah. like I have, which I've told them, I say, I'm a superior service for a fair price. And those are the people I look for. If they want the cheapest person, it's not me, just period. And I didn't have a problem saying that to people. And I realized that if you find the right property managers, I just saw a lot of advantages to it. So I completely ripped up that first piece of paper and just started saying like, how do I start now finding property managers? And I want to get into doing those hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And property managers, you know, just for everybody watching, they're just people. So there's going to be bad ones that do want everything cheap. There's going to be a lot of them who want you to be an employee, really. Like they want to be able to just call you 24 seven and kind of tell you where to go, what to work on and what to do. Um, but when you find the right ones, once you've vetted them and you've figured out like they pay you, whether it's in 30 days or one week or same day, whatever, whatever agreement you have with them, I feel like once you find the good ones, then you've got them and you don't have to vet them over and over and over. Like if you're working for homeowners, somebody's going to need their toilet fixed and you can go fix their toilet. But until the next thing breaks on their house, they're not of any value to you until you get another small job from them later, as opposed to property managers. You know, I've gone through, I'm going to say not much more than two dozen, probably not three dozen, but a couple dozen. And then I've got them now narrowed down to, you know, two big companies that have a few property managers each and then a handful of smaller companies. So I've got, you know, out of the two to three dozen, I've had to fire more than half of them. And by fire, I just mean, I just stopped accepting work from them. It's not like we have a big dramatic, you know, thing that goes down. But then once you've got them, you've got them. And if you do that professionally, if you do everything you were just saying about just showing up and doing your job and bringing in what you would bring in, like for me, I got that from the military. You got it from being an engineer in the corporate world. I was in the military, but it's the same attitude of like, hey, if you're working for us, you need to show up. You need to be groomed. You need to be professional. You need to be articulate. You need to actually do your job in a relatively efficient way. So I feel like it's a really good way to go. Have you tried to get started yet or are you still in the process of sort of figuring it out and ready to pull the trigger? Well, interestingly, I actually have a buddy who's uh, um, quite a bit younger than me, but uh, he does remodeling and handyman stuff. And he actually hooked up with a local property manager. And he's just like, Hey, you know, Rick, if you know, you ever, sometimes I get busy and can't do it. So I met the guy and he saw that I had a builder's license and he realized that I knew a lot of stuff and had been doing it a long time and that I was professional. And so we hit it off real well. And he started giving me stuff. The problem is, is that if I'm on somebody's, you know, $80,000 kitchen, I can't be taking days off to go be doing something else. So I told him, look, if I'm free, I can help you, but I can't leave my clients to come help you. And what we really found out after a while is it would be better for me just to say, hey, I got a week downtime. I can do some stuff. And so I kind of fell off the map with him. But about four months ago, when I realized I was going to make this transition, I had two or three jobs still on the books and I wasn't going to 
not follow through on those with people. So I said, look, I'm going to do these last three or four. And so I rehooked up with them about a month or so ago. And I said, look, I'll be coming on full time or I'll be available full time in October. And they have about 180 residential houses. So I think that's going to be a really good start. And then I'm just going to go do what you said with the packet and the professionalism and go knock on a few more doors, smile, bring some cookies and follow your your, T to, your script to the T. And I know, I mean, I probably like you, I feel like I could f jump out of a plane, land in a city, and the next day I'd have a place to stay, a church to go to and work to be able to do because you just have confidence in yourself. Yeah. You know, if you can if you can provide that, you don't have to know anybody. You just have to go do what you know what to do. And if you're willing to do that with integrity, the world's really yep. your oyster. I really feel that, so. That's so true. That's absolutely true. I hope the younger people watching this interview really take that away from you because it's absolutely true. If you just know what you can do and you've got the integrity to just get out there and do it the right way, the world is your oyster. Like you don't have competition out here. You really don't. And it's not like I'm the first one to thank everybody and you know, say, hey, you know, I got a great team. So you don't have to be prideful. You can just be confident. And a confident comes with experience. Like you said, you can't look at a move out list and say, oh, this is going to take me X until you've done a ton of them. So yep. it's great to research. It's great to listen to podcasts. But one of the best things you can do is roll up your sleeves, <laughs> make the best decisions you can. You got to be smart. And you just go out there and just work and fail and make mistakes yeah. and learn from it and then do some and more. Fail, and, and fail you know? and fail and fail. I just failed more than most people. I tell people the only reason I made it, it is I thought, hey, I just had to work two 40-hour weeks every week. Yep. And that would make up from what little I made and the mistakes that I made. And I was able to hang in there long enough until I finally figured it out a little bit better. And then I had some success. And then, like I said, post-COVID, it's now it's just gotten to be so hard. Um, I, I'm not saying it's not possible and if people really have a passion to do that, but go, go work for the elite for a while. I mean, it, you talked about that one thing about changing a chandelier once it's like, you're putting down the drop, you're putting on white gloves, you're putting up plastic, you're putting up this, you're wiping the rim after you take a leak. I mean, I bring my own paper towels. We bring our own, you know, hand towels, our own dish soap or bed. So we don't have to touch. It's, it's a big deal. It's not just a lot of money. It's a lot of work as well. And I think sometimes people don't realize that. Yeah. Well, I really like what you had to say about failing. I was surprised when you said it because I was I was already thinking when he's done, I'm going to mention the failing part. But you said it, too. And it's 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 another really important thing for new guys watching is to know to just going in. You might fail. Your whole business might fail. You might put all your time and effort into this. You might actually fail and have to just go back and get a job which I've done before. I don't know if you've heard me say on the channel, I've done this twice before. So this is my third time starting a handyman business. Both times that I started one in the past, I failed. I just, I didn't take it seriously enough. I didn't have the work ethic, whatever the issues were, I wasn't charging enough, which probably would have motivated me if I was charging more to get up and do more and do it faster and do it more professionally. But I, I do have a lot of people that email and comment and text and stuff that are just really worried that they don't know what they're doing. And my answer is you probably don't, you know, neither did I, when I started this business, I had a friend who wanted a kitchen built and it, it's a tiny, tiny little kitchen. And she was okay with like the cheaper home Depot cabinets. And she knew I grew up building custom kitchens. Like my stepdad was a custom cabinet maker. So I've done a few hundred custom kitchens building like, all of the raised panel doors, I've run stock through shapers for a thousand hours, probably between the age of like 12 and 18. And she knew that I had the skills and she wanted me to build her kitchen. And I literally just jumped into this. She asked me for a while and I kept telling her I can't. It's too much time. I have a job. And then I thought about the handyman business again. And I called her and said, hey, do you actually have the money like in the bank right now? Are you serious about pulling the trigger? Like I turn in my two week notice and in two weeks I'm at your house ripping out cabinets. Is this real? And she said, yeah. And I was like, okay, let's do it. And I turned in my two week notice and I can tell you, I failed at, I can't count how many things when I first got start. Her kitchen went smooth because I know kitchens. I've just done a bunch of them. But once I jumped into the handyman stuff with the property managers, I can't count how many times I just messed up and lost money. Like I just jumped into things I didn't know 
and almost everything that I do today, each, each type of work, each little specific task that I do, like changing out a shower cartridge. First time I ever changed out a shower cartridge or even thought about what was behind the wall where you turn on the shower. First time I did that was on a job where there was a shower dripping and I just showed up and that's the confidence that you're talking about. It's not pride, it's just confidence. I was just confident that whatever it is, it's figure outable. It's one of my favorite words. It's figure outable. Whatever it is, if all the other guys that are doing it, same thing when I had a food truck, I just said, if everybody else can run a food truck and make money, I can probably do it too. And I just dove in. It's really what you have to do. You know, it's, I think I've heard it said that before you're great, you'll be good. And before you're good, you're average. And before you're average, you'll be terrible and before you're terrible you have to start and it's yeah. just basically saying you know you don't want to go and i mean i got stories when i'd be doing like putting in a new panel or electrical panel for somebody i mean you got to be smart I, I could replace some things and go that probably wasn't my smartest choice but if you if you if you protect yourself from water and fire and stay away from the things where you really could do some damage, just go out there and fail. And I'll tell you, the sooner you fail and the more you fail, the sooner yeah. you'll be in a position where you're going to be saying, I made it because you just failed faster and quicker. And the sooner you get there, the sooner you make it. it it's literally that yeah. simple. I think that's the number one lesson that we could take away from this interview, probably for everybody who's just getting started is just knowing in advance when you go in, you just got to fail fast and often. And the more you fail and the more often you fail, and the faster you recover from that, the better you're going to do and the sooner you're going to get to that point. So you got a lot of experience then. I mean, clearly way more than I do just in the construction industry. What advice do you want to give out to anybody? Um, one of the things that I didn't learn till 10 years ago is you got to know your numbers. You have to know your numbers. And if you don't know your numbers, you're losing. And if you don't know your numbers and you think you're winning, you're probably losing even worse than you yeah. realize. Because when somebody showed me, well, where's your profit and overhead? And I'm like, well, I'm charging $30. I'm trying to make $30 an hour. And they're like, no, not your wage. What are you doing about profit and overhead? I didn't even know, Ray, what it was. So the first 20 years, I was just trying to make 30 bucks an hour. Yeah. And if you don't know your numbers to the penny, you're losing. Don't kid yourself. I've had people who said they're doing well, and I'll sit down with them, and we'll go over their numbers. And I'll go, how'd you do on that job? And they're like, man, I nailed it. I go, really? You made 17 bucks an hour. No, I didn't. And I'm like, well, let's look at it. And I'd show it to yeah. them, and they just, their jaw would just drop. And yeah. they said it was the biggest thing they ever learned was you got to know your numbers, and then you got to be willing to charge by your numbers. And here's the thing. When I got my numbers, I would see the price and I go, man, that seems high. But I could look them in the face and tell them that's what it was because I knew that's what I needed to yeah. feed my family. When I yeah. didn't know that, I would just go, oh, that sounds high. I better bring it down or they're going to say no. And I couldn't mm -hmm. fend for that right number, right? Because I, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. So you you couldn't the, back it up and explain it. Back it up. When, when you Not know that you should heart, need to explain to them, but in your own mind, you knew that you yeah. couldn't back up your numbers. And I'd be like, and they go, and, and when, when I knew that, they go, that's expensive. And I go, well, I completely agree. When would you like to start? <laughs> and they'd say Tuesday. And it was just that confidence that just came from, instead of like, in the beginning, Ray, I would take the quote. First, I'd call and make sure they weren't home. This was before we had cell phones. And then I take the quote over and I basically put it in the door and run away. I mean, that's where I started from on how scared I was to just get out there and try to sell myself. So not too many people are going to start at that place. So if there's hope for me, there's hope for anybody. You just got to keep doing what you got to do. So you got to know your numbers. You got to learn to stay in your lane. One of the biggest things I see both in remodeling and even when I watch and read handyman forums of people quoted a job and then they're asking advice on how to do it. So first off, I'd say, how did you even quote it? Because you don't know what you're doing. And then you're trying to go do something that you don't know what you're doing. You're just setting yourself up to fail. And so I think, you know, we got to start doing some things at some point. I mean, every time we had the first time we did A, B, C, D and E. 
But at some point, people, I think, would do a lot better if they realized this is what I'm good at. And I'm going to concentrate on staying in my lane and getting these jobs. Now, if you got to have work, maybe you got to do something else. But spend some of that time getting educated and practicing on your own things in your garage or your shop instead of going out on jobs. Because there's a huge difference between working and making money. You can just work to work. But if you're not making money because you're doing stuff you don't know how to do, there are a lot of other ways that you've talked about, too. And I just really think people would be better off putting their time into that than just saying yes to everybody and everything, because you're just not going to do well if yeah. you try to go that route. You need you to guess. figure out how the job's done. Maybe talk to some experts. I mean, I do love YouTube. You know, you can yep. there's guys on YouTube for everything who want to share every little detail and every little nuance of their specific little specialty in the trades. You can't quote if you don't know how the job's even done to begin with. And, and if a lot of people get in a lot of trouble with that yeah. too, because somebody says, how much for you to coat my deck? You know, I just want a fresh coating on my deck. And you don't realize until you get into it, everything that goes on with a deck, or you imagine you, I'm going to sand it. And you think to yourself like, yeah, I'm going to sand it. That'll be uh, a couple hours, you know, just with a sander. And then all of a sudden you realize your sander's probably going to die because it's black and decker. So now you're going to buy another sander and it's going to die because you bought a cheap one. And then you're going to buy a third sander. You're going to go through way more pads than you thought. It's going to take 10 times longer than you thought. You're going to be sanding really thoroughly at the beginning. And then you're going to realize you don't need to sand so thoroughly. But now this end is more smooth than that end. And that ain't going to work. There's so much stuff that's going to come up if you don't do like really thorough, thorough research. Or like I was saying, stair step up and don't start with refinishing somebody's entire deck. Start with rebuilding like a set of stairs up to a trailer, you know, and then graduate up from there. It's just so there's nothing wrong with saying that's not my specialty. You probably want to find somebody else to do that. I still do that today. It's one of the smartest decisions I ever made was just to stay in my own lane and just go, yeah, I probably could figure it out. But a lot of times I try to become Superman. I just become the goat. It just doesn't yeah. work out well and it sure doesn't pay well. So that's why I just encourage people, you know, change a couple of your switches at your own house and then maybe work for a family member. And then if someone's got something simple, start with that. But if you're just talking about like I took a job to wire a basement and you've never even ran a circuit before, the, the, the yeah. likelihood that that's going to come out well and be yeah. good for you and your business is just not very strong. And the likelihood you're going to be profitable at it. Yeah. At all. And that's bad because you, you might be busy, but. Yeah. Being busy doesn't pay the bills if you're not making any money. And that's where time might be better spent. You know, if you work 40 hours and didn't make anything, spend the 40 hours learning, watching YouTube videos, playing around with some stuff at your own house or family members, and then take that 40 hours into the next week. Now you've got more skill set than just saying yes to everything because you think, well, I can just go do it or it's not that hard because there's nuances to a lot of this, like you know, and it's one thing to say it went perfectly well. And then all of a sudden, when it doesn't go so well, that's when you're going to be in a world of hurt. And it's probably going to hurt your business and your reputation a lot more than if you just would have said, I'm graciously going to go decline this part of the job right here because it's just not my strong suit. Yeah, that's right. So what other advice might you have for new guys uh, or, or even for guys that aren't yeah. all that new and just haven't fit, they don't have the experience you have like me? I, I think systematizing yourself from the very beginning is one of the greatest things you can ever do. I didn't do it till later on. So that means when I put in a whole house water tank every seven years, every single time I had to relearn it because I never took any notes and I never created basically just like even just the major things that you learn from it. You know, you go, but you go, I'd go back to a house and I, a job I did 15 years ago and I'd like, I couldn't even do this tomorrow. Because I'd forgotten it all. Because I, I was yeah. one of those back then. I learned it and I did it well enough oh, to pull it off. I'm with but. you. I'm with you. I put in the whole, I put a shower, this house I'm living in, I bought 14 years ago during the recession when houses were dirt cheap. <clears throat> and I put in a shower where there hadn't previously been a shower. I don't know how to do that. I did it on this house. It's there. It works. I know I did it right, but I could not tell you off the top of my head right now, the actual steps involved in the measurements and the setbacks or any of that. And yet 
somehow I did it. But I wish I would have taken some notes and taken some pictures along if the way. If you took 15 minutes, it can save you 15 hours, you know what I'm saying, the next yeah. time around. And so what I did, and it's probably 200 pages long, but I just started a Word document and I just put ceiling fan. What did I learn? 15 minutes. And then it's like I go to do a sump pump and it's like, oh, you know, backup sump pump, Liberty SJ10 is a model number. This is where I got it from. This is about how long it took me. And you'll oh, be yeah. amazed after amount of time that if you ever get one of those jobs, you just go back to that little cheat sheet and you can do it electronically now on you know, iPads yeah. and stuff and, and make it even more less primitive than what I did growing up doing a lot of that stuff. But, and then if you, if, if, cause if you ever want to grow your business, you need a system for the least, the least technical thing so that you can give it to somebody to have them do it. And if you don't have systems, you're never going to be able to grow your business. So if you just start coming up, how do I answer the phone? That's my system. Mm -hmm. Write it yeah. down. Right. And How have a way to answer it and then yep. answer it that way like every lead, single lead time you example. answer that phone. And then, you know, when I when I hire my nephew to work for me and he's answering the phone, I hand him the piece of paper and it's going to take a little bit of coaching. But if you just sit, if you think you're going to hire somebody and stand over and train them while you're paying them and you think you're going to make any money, because not only you, you can't work and train at the same time, you can't be the worker and you can't be the boss at the same time. And I found more than anything else, when I try to work and be the boss, my work goes down, which is where I make my money. And so I just lose money overall. So if you start to create systems, then if you ever want to grow it, they're already in place. And you just start with the lowest position and you hand that one off. And then you hand the next lowest off and you just kind of work your way out of a job if that's what you want to do but without implementing systems. And if you wait till you're 10 years in and you decide to start it, it'll take you a hundred times longer if you did 10 minutes every day on day one and, and 10 minutes on day two and 10 minutes on day three. Yep, that's cool. I want to be respectful of your time. You said you had until nine and I that believe was, for you, yep. it's almost nine. I'm fine. No, that was more so just, okay. I did I, I early to bed, early to rise kind of a thing, but I don't yep. go to bed that soon. So I'm fine. Um, I can keep chatting if you think it's useful or helpful. No, and, this is a great conversation. Like I said, you you clear you've got thirty years experience in construction. I have my childhood, a couple failed handyman businesses. I've I've remodeled most of my house, but you've got so much more experience than I do. So I think any any advice that you feel like handing out while we're on here, I'm at, I'm in, I'm interested in hearing not just for everybody else, but for me as well. Yeah. Um, I am curious if you've read the E-Myth books. I've, I've, I've read it two or three times and I've actually done some coaching with them as well. It's a fantastic okay. book and I, it actually popped into my head when I was talking about systems and I would say that's a great read. Also a yeah. book called Traction is another great read that talks about systems. And if you read one or both of those books, you will, your eyes will just be completely opened to what's possible and how cool and how great systems really are. And it, systems work for us. I mean, your kits, that's a system. How you've scheduled, that's a system. How you're starting to train your son to do things, that's a system. Jobber is a system. I mean, you just have a bunch of systems and systems are predictable, duplicatable, and they just make you efficient. And if you want to make more money, you have to become efficient, period. Yeah. Choose how you want to do it, but you have to get, I always tell the story. I used to do a lot of basements and I'd put the recessed lights up and I'd make a decent wage. And I'd just say, you know, Hey, how do I get better at this? So it's like, well, okay, instead of using a tape measure, I'm going to buy a chalk line, not put any chalk in it, make two measurements, run the string across the ceiling and then I'm going to put little pieces of tape on it where the lights need to go. And then I'm going to get these smaller wire nuts because I only have to turn them twice instead of six times. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And I yeah. tripled the amount of money I made installing those lights. And I just did that literally for everything yeah. that I did. And it's amazing how much more efficient you can be. So either it's more time with your family or it's more money or it's just yeah. more free time making the same money. I mean, you're winning on all accounts. Yeah, and I like what you mentioned, like even just the wire nuts, just saving a few seconds on something that you're going to do 387 times this year. It might come out to $38 at the end of the year, and maybe that's not much money. But if you can do that 
with 167 itty bitty little things times $38 each, all of a sudden you've added a few thousand dollars or $10,000 to your total revenue for the year. And those things never end. It's like the, you know, that you mentioned my kits, my hose bib kit, just the fact that I have a hose bib kit and that I know it's got every single thing in it. And I know just the seconds that it takes me when I get out of the van where normally I would walk around and I would go pull out two or three or four different boxes and try to figure out where one one tool is or another tool is that I might need in that kit. Or maybe I've got my little rubber washers or in some other kit. Just having a hose bib kit and knowing that that's the kit, that saves me, I don't know, a minute and a half of just rummaging through the van. Even if I know where everything is, it's going to take me a minute and a half to just go to each place and grab all the items. Putting it into the kit saves that minute and a half. And all the little things you do, they add up so much that that is where the financial efficiencies are here. Like that's how you go. It's easy to make like if you want 50 grand a year, which is like median income for an American. If you want to make 50 grand a year as a handyman without efficiencies, without kits, without processes, you can absolutely do that. Like you can just go out there and like you said, just stay busy. If your goal is to stay busy, you can make average income for an American with your handyman business. But if you want to make six figures or if you want to grow this, if if you want your time that you're taking from your family and from your loved ones and from yourself, because I'd rather be gardening half the time than doing handyman work. If you're going to take that time from everybody, you could give that all back, whether it's to yourself or to them, or you can turn it into money just by taking, like you said in the beginning, 10 minutes here and there, 10 minutes once a day. One of the things I used to do, it's, uh, I think it's called the lean method in the corporate world. I could be wrong, but I think it's called lean. And lean is all about like, you can move a piece of equipment so that it's now three steps away instead of six steps away. But what you do is at the end of every day, you just write down where you messed up, like where you lost time, where you weren't efficient. So if you had to drive to Home Depot, Maybe you're changing out a toilet and you got the new toilet, but you didn't check to see if that toilet comes with, because most of them are going to come with the wax ring, but you didn't check and you accidentally bought one that didn't come with a wax ring. At the end of the day, you have to be able to blame yourself Mm -hmm. for what you messed up on. And if you can't do that, like if you can't look at yourself and say, here's how I sucked today. Here's the mistakes I made that cost me. If you can't do that, You can't ever fix those things. And I feel like one of the first steps is just at the end of every day is figuring out without beating yourself up, but just saying, what did I do wrong today? Where did I, was I not paying attention to something and I took a wrong turn with my, or I I missed my exit on the GPS because I was on the phone and the next exit was three miles down and I had to drive all the way back through town. But you have to, at the end of every day, like you said, even if it's just 10 minutes is just take your notes and Go back and look at what you did, what you did right, what you did wrong, and what you might need to remember in the future for that type of job. It's a mistake if you don't learn from it. But if you can learn from it right now, it's just training, right? It's just getting better. It's like someone I don't you I was watching one of your podcasts and somebody had something and they were saying something was a problem. And you said, no, it's just an opportunity. It's just a problem that needs to be solved. And as much as some people said, well, you know, you went to school all this time to be an engineer and you're not using it. It's like, well, I do use it. I'm problem solving. And that's really all life is, whether it's, you know, you, your kids and your wife or, you know, our families, relationships, it's really just problem solving. If you have that mindset. And I know one person taught me early on that um, regardless of what happens in my life, I need to look in the mirror as a business owner and that's whose responsibility is. Now you can call it fault. I call it responsibility. It's just wordsmithing because I don't want to be beating myself up. And I don't, I used to back in the day, but if you just call it your responsibility, it's always your responsibility. And what I learned is sometimes I'm only 1% wrong, but I'm only 1% wrong. So how do I learn from that 1% mistake? You know, maybe I didn't ask the question. I could say they didn't give me the answer, but I didn't ask the question. I didn't ask it clear enough. I didn't state back what they said to make sure that that's what they said. And you can just, you just continue to do that. It's like the domino. Um, Gary Keller has a great book called The One Thing. And he talks about every day you're just 
trying to tip over one domino. It doesn't seem like anything. And you look at it and they call it a hockey stick graph because for the longest time, it's just, you know, it's just going flat line. And even though it's domino day, domino day, domino day, domino day, and all of a sudden you get to the curve in that stick and it's just exponential growth. And the growth yeah. over here didn't start from the day before. It started way back it here when you were doing started way nine, back where you yeah. didn't think nobody's looking, nobody cares, nobody knows, but you know, you're just doing that 10 minutes every day. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. And boy, you'll look back and you'll go, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's like almost everything you touch turns to gold. Doesn't mean you don't still have problems, but you just have the confidence and you have the reassurance. It's like, I'll figure it out. No big deal. And you can handle tough people the same way. You know, you, when you're working with residential clients, especially if they're the higher end, sometimes, you know, they're going to request more from you and you just learn to just deal with that. And you just learn to, you know, you can just learn to say things differently. And, you know, like my contracts, not only did I say what I'm doing at one point, I said, and this is what I'm not doing. And I'd state them all just because that way I knew if we ever got to a problem and they said, well, you replace the ceiling fan like you talked about. And now the cover ring is a little bit smaller so it doesn't cover that painting. My quote says, you know, install new ceiling fan, you know, no painting or touch up or, and it's just, if you tell people not only what you're doing, but what you're not doing and the communication is good, it'll solve 90% of your problems. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like you were saying earlier, that comes only with experience. You're not aware of that issue until you've installed about 20 ceiling fans. Then you go, <laughs> man, like five of those 20 or three or four of those 20 did have that issue. And now, you know, going into the next ceiling fan, you're like, ah, yeah, this frequently happens. They're going to want that touched up. I need to put that, either put that in the estimate, what it's going to cost if that occurs, or put in the estimate or let them know somewhere in writing that that's not included. It just helps everybody out. Um, I know I wrote, um, I think I did a comment on one of your videos when somebody had said something about like when you're doing big jobs, you know, the, all the unforeseen things. It's like, if you can't see it and you can't quote it, you just can't say bummer and leave it out of the contract. You need to say address, you know, old galvanized water supply lines or cast iron drain lines to be determined. You know, um, if we're doing a bathroom, I can't see how flat the floor is. It's got mud pack on it, you know, but when I get it all demoed, it looks like a roller coaster. Well, I just can't put hardy backer on it. Then we might have to put floor level or, or pour a new floor. So I put those in as to be determined. And you just learn after a while, it just becomes this master list. And when you're doing a bathroom, you've got these 20 things, rotten wood, et cetera, et cetera. That way you're not on the hook for having to ask for more money for something they've never heard of before. Cause I tell them, look, all these to be determined, we can't know until we get it demoed and we'll address them via a change order you know, when that happens and they appreciate that because then they can start to think like, well, this is our budget, but we got to keep a little more because there might be some of these unforeseen problems. It's just communication. It'll solve so many problems. And it's really easy once you get comfortable at doing it and knowing what to say. It really makes your life a lot easier. Yeah. Um, I want to offer you a small piece of advice. You might just tell me that this was already the case in the remodel world. Um, but inventory, I think, is going to be a much bigger deal for you. And similar to how you were talking about before with uh, oh, what, what were we just talking about that really, oh, the efficiencies and the processes. I feel like being a handyman going to number one, where you're doing lots of little jobs. And number two, you're doing a lot of them per day. I feel like inventory probably wouldn't be a big deal on remodels because you're going to be looking at a lot of stuff and then making a lot of purchases. But I can tell you with the handyman work, one of the things that will skyrocket your efficiency mm -hmm. and therefore your time or your revenue, which are the same thing, is going to be inventory and also standardizing what your inventory is so that you don't need to have every single model of every single thing but you'll find out from experience that most faucets are similar to a certain type of faucet. Most light bulbs are gonna be these types of light bulbs. You're gonna need like microwave bulbs. There's about three, there's 20 that it could be, but there's about three that it's usually going to be. 
but inventory for you and for anybody watching yep. for me getting an inventory finally i think almost doubled just how efficient i was and how much money i could make on a per hour basis because you could do I, any of these jobs in 15 or 20 minutes yeah but it's an hour to go to home depot and back. i um I actually this morning was writing down some goals and per the webinar that you had yesterday that I watched, I put the two most important things I have to solve are inventory and having the right parts to lessen my trips and keep my efficiency up and scheduling. And so those are the two that I'm already started working on. And I used to do that even when I did the big remods, I'd have like a demo tub and we actually had inside the cover was a list in a plastic and like document. Word doc in a plastic sleeve that said everything that was in that was supposed to be in that tub. And when it when my son was working for me, he would he was in charge of that. He'd look through the list, make sure everything's in it, put it on the shelf. When we did another job, we'd grab that demo tub. We had like a first in box, we had electrical box, we had a hardy backer box, and we just I pretty much did the same thing, even though we were doing bigger projects. And I can already see, even like I see these guys that do handyman, they have these pull-out bed boards right in the back of their truck when they don't have a van and they have everything stacked like in this one pile and it looks really sweet you know all milwaukee cases and i looked at that and i went great i'm going to need something in the very bottom i don't like that setup so instead i'm going to build drawers that roll out but it's going to be one case by itself so that if i want something it's third drawer third one back bam i don't want to be taking half my truck apart and say i have it there but then I have to spend 15 minutes getting at it because I didn't think through the fact of this isn't very efficient. It might look cool and to each their own. But I think having things just set up. So you like the what take. I always just go back to that wire nut. It seems so small, but just keep knocking over those dominoes every mm -hmm. day, every, every minute day. of every day. And you're going to do great. Paperwork, contracts, especially on bigger jobs. So, so, so important. Um, I've actually been able to take like names off my contract and we can talk about this at another time but when i was in some other um forums and just uh uh little small groups online and stuff people would say like oh i'd love to see your contract i'd be happy to show it to anybody it's nothing privileged it's just things that i've learned over the years but if you don't have a good contract you're going to be set up to lose period so what's nice i haven't had one legal issue in 30 years because my contracts just spell out everything. I mean, 17 pages long. And I used to go like, oh, I can never give somebody something that's 17 pages. They'll be mad at me and all this stuff. And finally, I just learned, look, they're going to know I'm professional. They're going to know I'm a business. There's things in there that I have to be held accountable to. It's just not, it protects both of us. And if you don't have that stuff in there, trust me, you're just going to run into a problem after a problem after a problem. And after three months, if you think you had a bad handyman day, have have about 60 of them in a row <laughs> or have yeah. 30 out of 60 days and let me know what your numbers look like then, you're going to lose money. Not only are you not going to make money, you're going to lose money. So it's really important to have good contracts that spell out start time, start days. How do you get into the house? If nobody's there, you've got a fee for this and just kind of like what you do with the handyman stuff, the same thing. You just got to set it up well and make sure that you're protecting both you and your client. Because part of what people are paying us money to do is to protect them. And if we're integrity as contractors, we're not just looking out for, like I tell people, if it's not a win-win, I'm not going to do it. This isn't a win for me and a lose for you. This has to be a win-win or if it's, or it's no deal. And you got to think that way. And if you start thinking that way, you'll actually do a lot better than if you're just thinking for yourself. Cause sooner or later that wheel falls off. It's going to come back oh, yeah. right in the backside. Yeah. Everybody no, knows it. No shortcuts. And like, I love something you said. I knew I'd get along with you really great. If you don't fix the problem, you don't get to charge money. If you forget exactly. to add it, if you get, to, I had one lady that said somebody redid their basement. They did a bathroom and they wanted $500 to hook up the sink. They told them because they didn't know they wanted it done. Really? You're going to put in a bathroom and a sink and then come back and pull that kind of game. 
that is going to be a short ticket to a bad place. If you yep. do those kind of things, you got to be yeah. integritous. You got to go, Hey, where was I 1% wrong? We're always 1% wrong and get better at it because the harder you, are, I was always, I was the hardest one on me. So nobody had to be hard on me. I had the people would say like, Rick, if it meets your standards, it's going to meet ours. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And it's a really great place. To, and I'm not talking about spending three days in a corner closet trying to make sure the angle's 90 degrees, right? I'm not talking like legalistic goofiness here. I'm just talking about providing a good service, doing what you say you're going to do, show up when you're going to show up, do your job clean up every day. That's one of the things that I always did is I would sweep. I would take every, all my guys wanted to go home. I just enjoyed making it look spotless to the degree that yeah. I could every day before I left. And if you do that, trust me, people notice. I bring in garbage cans on the days I'm there for them. I never say a word. I don't tell them I did it. I bring them in. I just set them up near the garage. If there's packages on the porch, I'll bring them inside. People have been on vacation. They come home in the middle of the winter. I snow blowed their drive because I knew they were coming in. Do you think I got a client for life now with that person? It's just little things Absolutely. that make you look different than everybody else. And if you can differentiate yourself, people will pay the price that you want, period. Yep. Yep. And they'll be happy to. And they'll do as it as long happily. as you keep doing everything that you've said, just giving yep. them the quality work not shortcutting on anything. And that's something you're going to find too, by the way, when you, if you dive into this handyman thing, especially with property managers, you're going to be amazed how many times you're going behind some other crappy handyman and the stuff you will find. Like I, I say, I give this example so many times, but I still keep finding it is when you go to do a loose towel bar in a bathroom, and you go remove that towel bar. And the reason it's loose is because it's screwed into expanding foam because somebody else, and it was a handyman. It wasn't the homeowner. It wasn't the tenant. It was some other handyman that showed up on that job and either didn't want to put the time in or just didn't know what he was doing. So we shortcut it and just put it in expanding foam. And I know that he knew that that wasn't going to last. And there are guys in this industry, probably in the remodel industry too, I would bet that go and start their business. They go find a bunch of clients. They do bad work. They know they're doing bad work, but they also know that nobody's going to realize how bad their work is until it's been three months that have passed by and they can move on to new clients and do more bad work. But I think it's especially bad in the handyman industry and especially with property managers, because when you find one, they have to have a handyman. They have to. It's not optional. It's not like a tool that you can grab some other tool. You know, like you can use a jigsaw or a skill saw or a reciprocating saw. You have to have a handyman. It's just not optional. And you take whoever you can get until the right guy comes along and you keep them. But in the meantime, there's guys that know that if they can find that property manager that's desperate, they can go do shoddy work and nobody's going to know for three months. And when they start finding out and giving them callbacks, they just stop answering the phone. They find another desperate property manager. But that is the quickest way to not succeed in this industry. And I had one recently where I had a little bit of downtime. So I went and did a couple jobs for that handyman uh, manager. And uh, one was kind of emergency. They had water in the basement. And so I went and I looked at it and uh, the sump pump wasn't working. And so I called them and I told them and I said, I'll go back tomorrow and I'll pump out all the water. And I said, Hey, by the way, you know, that tag, I looked at the tag. It, it was a, uh, it was um, uh, Liberty pump. And I looked and it, it wasn't even three years old. And I just knew that they have a three-year warranty on them because that's the pump I use. And so I was mentioning it to the property manager. He was completely unaware of it. And he said, you know, I had a plumbing company put that in. I'm going to give him a call. And I checked out with him later. And he said, yeah, they came and put a new one in for free. You think they nice. don't realize that? You know what I'm saying? And that's just one of those things where, and I was nice to the tenant. And he said, you know, we've had like 10 handyman here. You're the only person that has ever made me feel good. And I'm kind of thinking like, I don't even know what I did, but I said, hi, his wife had a Lions jersey on. So I talked to her about that. I asked the names of the kids. I said hello to them and I waved at them. I mean, it's not hard, but it's just those little things that can separate you. And just, you won't have, your competition will be people will be fighting over wanting you to work. 
that'll yep. be the competition that you have, not from other trades, exactly right. but just from people that are all going to want you and you can only be in one place at one time. But it's a great problem to have. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I do. I, I want to shut this down here pretty quick um, so you can get to bed. No. It's later where yeah. you're at, but also so I can get to my family yeah. as well. You bet. Um, so you've had a lot of great advice. I want to give you an opportunity to say anything in closing that you'd like to say in closing. And then also, hopefully, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if we could schedule another interview, maybe not super soon, but would you w be willing oh, to yeah. come back and share a lot more? I'd like you to dive in to a little more detail on most of the big issues that you've brought up tonight. Yeah. But like I said, I also want to be respectful of your time and also my family yeah. needs me. Um, but I want to give you the opportunity to say whatever you want to say in closing. And then if you can stay on for a couple minutes after we're done, I'd like to talk to you personally yeah. about one or two. Things. You got it. Um, so what I want to say with my closing time is I've been in this industry for over 30 years. I've seen a lot of people and I've heard a lot of words of advice. And you, Mr. Ray, have one of the greatest things going that I've ever seen. If somebody's interested in being a handyman, they need to sincerely listen to what you're saying and follow that advice to the T. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. One of the biggest mistakes I made is no matter what anybody said when I was young and thought I knew everything is, oh, I'm going to build a better mousetrap. There's no need for people to do that. They need to support you in all the ways that you've told us that we can. They need to get the word out and they need to help you help others because it's going to help them as well. You are a great asset, asset to this industry. And with everything that I know, I'm following everything that you're saying to the T. And I recommend that everybody else do that as well, because you are the real awesome. deal, brother. Thank you very much. That's very kind and generous of you. Thank you, sir. Um, th thank you for your time and to everybody else. I uh, love you guys. I hope you're out there killing it. And hopefully me and Rick will see you on the next one. Thank you.